the Northfield Holistic Health Summit 2024, was pleased to host Dr. Rob Lindsay on the topic of functional toxicology. This is a recording of the keynote presentation Dr. Lindsay made to the participants of the Health Summit on May 4, 2024. Dr. Rob Lindsay received his doctorate of chiropractic from Northwestern Health Sciences University and holds a master's degree in sports medicine. He specializes in working with patients who suffer from chronic neuralgic and metabolic conditions such as migraines, vertigo, dizziness, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, neuropathy, ADHD, hypothyroidism, autoimmune diseases, and many others covers the basis pretty well, and has a strong interest in the relationship between the brain, emotions, and body physiology, and how emotionally traumatic events can contribute to disease. Dr. Lindsay lives with his lovely wife, Denise, and their four boys, Elijah, Noah, Micah, and Jonah, in Savage, Minnesota. He is actively involved with his church, Evergreen Church in Lakeville, and enjoys oh. softball, camping, and chasing his very active boys around the yard. So as you saw in the title, bioresonance testing is healthcare based on physics instead of biochemistry. It is well known that matter has two states, electric or energetic and physical. The medical profession and the scientific community deal exclusively with the physical state of substances, which is the biochemistry. Dr. Lindsay works within the physical and electrical states. The changes to a person's body occur electrically before they occur physically. Functional toxicology is an integrative system which brings together a variety of disciplines such as quantum physics, biophysics, toxicology, immunology, endocrinology, acupuncture points, and homeopathy. The process utilizes a form of brain reflex testing through which Dr. Lindsay monitors a sequence of reflexes exhibited by the body in response to numerous stressor elements. Please welcome Dr. Rob Lindsay as he, prevents, as he presents functional toxicology and the use of bioresonance testing to identify and remove patho pathogens. Dr. Rob Lindsay. Thanks. It'd be awesome to pre prevent, all right? Um, it, was, it was a September Sunday in 2013, and when I woke that morning and lifted my head off the pillow, I felt uh, a lightning bolt shoot down my right arm. And it was hard to, hard to describe because it was, my thought was it was lightning because it was a burning pain, and yet my fingertips were numb. And I quickly put my head back on the pillow, and it subsided a little bit. I lifted my head up again, and there was the lightning bolt again. And I'm a chiropractor by training, and so I'm thinking, okay, what happened in my neck? And I carefully rolled over and got up, and I found that if I put my head into a flexed and kind of laterally bent position like this, the pain lessened a lot. So. The day before that, my family and I, we had been out in the backyard pulling weeds. And I w had gone to pull uh, one of these weeds, and I realized, because it, it kind of kind of jolted me, that it wasn't actually a weed. It was a, a really thin root from a tree that was about 10 feet over. You know the kind where it kind of comes along the surface and then comes up? And <clears throat> but at the time, I didn't feel an anything. I didn't think about it. But then that morning when that pain happened, I thought, oh my goodness, I, I must have done something to my neck when that happened. And as a chiropractor, my first thought was, uh, it's a disc, okay, because disc injuries, a herniated disc often will put pressure on a nerve. Well, I have, I have some pretty good resources as a chiropractor. I go back to my office on Monday, and um, there's other chiropractors there. So I go to Dr. Aaron, I tell him what's up, he puts me on the table, only I can't even lay face down on the table in a neutral position because even in neutral, like this, the pain was excruciating. I crawled to the, to the front of the table and hung my head down 
in a full flexed position because that took away some of the pain. So Dr. Aaron adjusted me. And he adjusted me again that same day. Now I have other resources. We have massage therapy at our office. So I go to see Michelle. And Michelle does massage work. Same thing. I have to be, uh, you know, forward flexed off the end of the table. So I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be you know, several days at least. A couple weeks go by. It, there's no, there's no uh, relenting of this pain unless I am like this. So I have another colleague who works way up in Moundsview, and he had a, a, a fancy traction table called a decompression table, and I'm like, I, I need to go up there. So I make the track. He checks me out. He goes, yeah, it's a disc. Everything is pointing to it's a disc. So he puts me on this traction table, and for about five minutes, five to ten minutes on that table, I have relief. And I'm thinking, okay, I, we know what this is. We know what this is. I continue to go there a couple weeks. The pain's not really changing. Now they're throwing in cold laser, uh, laser treatments on it to try to de decrease inflammation. Um, I, I'm not a guy who, I, I don't even have an aspirin in my house. Okay, I, I haven't had one since I was in chiropractic school. But um, I, I took some pain meds because I needed to take the, I, I still had to work. And they weren't even doing anything. So I'm just trying to paint this picture uh, first of all, number one, I got a new appreciation for what my patients go through because I had never had that kind of thing. But um, how unrelenting some of these things can be. Well, time goes by. And following the in the next month, I started to learn something, um, some, some stuff about bioresonance testing. I really had no idea what it was except for when I was in chiropractic school, uh, there had been a group of kind of outcast type chiropractors who did something called muscle testing. And we, I kind of thought, no, nah, that's a little out there for me. I'm not getting into that. And <clears throat> so, but I met another chiropractor who talked about a form of bioresonance testing where he was trying to find actual specific causes, like named causes of this stuff. So I had gone and taken a, a, an intro introductory course in October through the pain. Okay. Fast forward to the following August now. Okay, so it's been 11 months. My pain is no, le no better. I, I did not want to go uh, to get surgery. I, I really thought that was my only hope at that point. But I know that 50% of cervical surgeries uh, say, uh, fail. It's a bad gig. It doesn't work very well. And now you're left with hardly any recourse. Okay, so... I go to, I, I decided to continue taking some coursework in the stuff I'm going to talk to you guys about. I'm in San Diego, and I am at the advanced coursework training. And I'm sitting there trying to listen to a guy lecture, uh, and I'm like this. Because if I go like this, I got lightning. I don't want lightning, so I go like this. One of the other doctors is sitting there says, why don't you have these guys test you? I didn't do this physically, but in my mind, I rolled my eyes. Because I'm like, how is this guy going to help me with my di blown disc? But in desperation, I'm like, yeah, I will. So I, in between, uh, on one of the breaks, I go to back. He lays me on a table. And within about five minutes, he goes, it's not your disc. He says, it's a nerve root, and it's got Roundup in it. And I'm like, again, rolled my eyes in my head. And I thought, this guy is full of it. But then, and this is the part I left out, conveniently, I remembered that day that my family had been out pulling these weeds, we had a few thistles out there, and I didn't want my kids to be getting into these thistle bushes. And so I had grabbed some Roundup, and I spot sprayed two little plants. Now, look, I know better, but it, it's a quick and pretty easy way to get rid of these thistles. And so I thought for a second, well, what if he really is right about this? So, you know, and that day, I remember the, the wind wasn't loft, you know, wafting around. It wasn't like I breathed it that I thought. But I thought, what if? So he proceeds to make me a couple of remedies. We call them remedies. I didn't put a lot of stock into it. I flew back to, to, to uh, uh, Minnesota Somebody had to ship me these remedies because there wasn't anybody locally who did this kind of work. And 
I'm telling you, I took these drops, these drops, the remedy, and within a week, my pain was gone. Gone. And I was like, holy buckets, there's something to this. I got to learn how to do this. Now, the tip of my pointer finger has a little bit of numbness. That's it. A little bit. And it's not constant. But I thought, oh my goodness, there's something to this. I got to learn this. And lo and behold, right around that same time, you know, I was pretty happy being a chiropractor, by the way, adjusting people. And, and, uh, but, but about that same time, God started to send people to me that I had no business I felt at the time, just I couldn't adjust this stuff away. They, they had fibromyalgia. They had chronic fatigue syndrome. They had, they'd come and they'd say, gosh, I, Doc, I've got, I just got diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease. What do I do? And I'm like, I don't know, and I don't know where to send you because I know that the route that you're going to get sent on is going to be medication for le- forever, and it's still never going to figure it out. So, so I was like, okay, Lord, are you trying to tell me something here? Maybe this is something I need to do. And that's where we're at right now. So <clears throat> I need to start with a little bit of uh, science, okay? So I'm glad it's not right after lunch. <laughs> Your brains are still in tune a little bit. Um, that's not working. Maybe if I do that. Okay, so you can go to the next one. Okay, so atoms. Everyone loves to talk about atoms and atomic theory and and all that stuff, right? It's a favorite thing. Okay, so here's the thing. Everything in the universe, everything God made is made up of atoms. Everything. The chair you're sitting on, everything. Now, over the last couple hundred years, we've learned a lot about atoms, Matter of fact, there's a whole field of of study called quantum physics, and quantum physicists try to explain how the universe works by studying atoms. And we've learned that atoms have certain characteristics, like they have weight, and they have mass, and they have different numbers of electrons. But something that most people, at least in my experience, have not heard about is that atoms have uh, a frequency, okay? They vibrate. We could call it resonance. That's another word for it. You can call it uh, a harmonic frequency. And if you have the right technology, you can measure that every kind of atom has its own unique frequency. For example, a carbon has a certain frequency, an oxygen, a hydrogen, a boron, a zinc, a mercury, any atom that you can think of, really anything that's on the periodic table, all those elements are atoms. They all have a very specific, very unique frequency. And next slide. So I like to try to use a couple of analogies with this. So when it comes to frequencies, I want to just think about um, I think about a guitar. And you can kind of see some vibration on those strings there. I, and I'm not a guitar player, but I know enough that if I have a guitar that's in tune and I pluck a certain note, uh, what, what you're going to hear, what I'm going to hear is a frequency. We're not going to see it, but you're going to hear it. And it's probably going to sound pleasant to your ear because it's in tune. Probably sounds nice. But if I have that same guitar and it's slightly out of tune and I pluck the same note, even if you aren't musically inclined, you probably might go, huh, that sounds a little off. It's just a little out of tune. Another example, next please, is your radio. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that some people in here um, listen to the radio when they drive in their car. I get all these young people who are like, no, no, I don't listen to radio. I just do podcasts and Bluetooth or whatever. Um, free, does anybody listen to the radio? <laughs> all right. Who, what's your favorite station, ma'am? Oh, my goodness. I opened a can of worms here. Hey, there's a really good station um, uh, called KTIS. Um, KTIS is a station... Up in Roseville, it's a, there's an antenna in Roseville. Uh, on the radio dial, it's 98.5, okay? Now, what that means is that they have, a, they have an antenna, a tower, and it's giving off a signal at 98.5 megahertz. Mega means million. Hertz means vibration. Or per, so 98.5 million vibrations per second, okay? And that antenna gives off that signal, and that signal trans, trans, you nobody sees it, 
But as long as the tuner in your car, the antenna, is tuned to 98.5, there's a match there. In physics, they call it constructive interference. And there's a match. And then somehow, that frequency gets routed through your antenna, and you get to hear, I don't know, casting crowns, or whatever your band is. And something that I think is interesting, though, is that that, that sound, that music you hear, actually started as a physical thing. This band got together in a recording studio, and um, they played the music, they recorded it, then they found a way to digitize that and attach it to a radio wave, and then you and I get to hear it. Nobody sees it, nobody questions it. They listen to it. And by the way, around the Twin Cities, there I don't know, there's several dozen radio stations, and every single one of those stations has its own very unique signal. It works best at that, at that frequency, at that signal. So you tell me, what would happen if I'm trying to listen to 98.5 and my dial gets tuned to 98.7? What do you think might happen? Static, right? It's off just a little bit, but it's not perfect. See, there's an ideal frequency for every station. And just like there's an ideal frequency for every radio station, there's an ideal frequency for every atom. Okay, now, you want to try again? Oh, yeah, I, I know, I know, I got it, thank you. I was wondering why that light kept flashing every time I pressed that button. Did you guys like that frequency, by the way, <laughs> that laser? Okay. There we go. Wow, you're really good at this. Um, so when you start to put enough atoms together, you get a molecule, right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen. They each have their own frequency. I bring them together. Now I have water. I don't get it. I can't explain it. I got a gas and I got a gas. I bring them together. Now I've got liquid. And this liquid I can bathe in. I can drink, okay? We, we can go water skiing in this in this water. And water now, if I had the right technology, I could measure that that water has its own unique frequency, different than the others. Now, if I add one more oxygen, I've got H2O2. And now I have hydrogen peroxide, right? That's another liquid, looks the same, but I'm not going to drink it, right? It wouldn't be good for me to do that. Why? Because the properties have been changed by adding one more atom. My point is this. When you bring enough different combinations of atoms together, you'll get a molecule. And when you bring enough molecules together, eventually you're going to get a human cell. Your cells, every single one of them, are made up of combinations of atoms and therefore have their own unique frequency. I hope that's making sense right now so far. Now, here's the cool part. <clears throat> I happen to have, because these, these, these physicists working in conjunction with um, uh, biologists, they actually have measured the frequency of all the different tissues of the body. And just like every radio station has its own frequency, so does every kind of cell in the body. It works best at that frequency. A liver cell. By the way, in the liver, there are lots of different kinds of cells, and every single one of them has its own unique substance-specific frequency. It works best at that frequency. So we've been brought up, I was brought up, all through school, to believe that we're a bunch of chemical reactions. And we do. We have a lot of chemicals. We have enzymes. We have hormones. Okay, we have neurotransmitters. We have all these different kinds of, of chemicals. But what we've been learning in the last um, several you know, decades is that it's the physics that actually commands and controls the release of the chemistry. Okay, so I happen to have, you can see these, these are this example of these little test vials. And, and I, I, brought, I actually brought a box here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well. But um, I'm just going to pick at random here. This is pancreas. Little tiny vial filled with water. It's just water. It's not just water. Water actually has some unbelievable ability to hold on to information. If I say information, I'm saying frequency. So some really smart people measured the frequency of healthy pancreas tissue. They found a way to digitally imprint it into the water. The 
the water holds it. I can do all kinds of stuff with this, and that frequency does not leave it. And I know that sounds absolutely crazy, right? It sounds crazy. But I've got a little analogy for you. DVDs. All of you have used a DVD before. A DVD is a hunk of plastic. It's a little disc. It's a hunk of plastic. And somebody figured out a way to put a movie on it. I don't understand it, but they, they made a movie, and then they took the information or the, the movie itself and imprinted it onto the disc. And I plug it into my little DVD player, and some lasers go around, and I get to watch a movie. Again, I don't understand it, but you guys get that, right? You can do that. It's the same idea with this pancreas. So every cell tissue in the body has this ideal frequency. It works best at, like I said. Now, here's, here's where, uh, let me go back. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to switch directions a little bit, and then we'll come back to, like, how does the bioresonance testing work? But I just think it's really important for, for you guys to know that um, I think that probably the reason that, that I exist in what I do now is this right here. It's to remove pathogens. And we're exposed to pathogens all over the place all the time. There's lots of toxins around here. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not one of those, like, environmental, like, do all that, you know, get rid of all that stuff, guys. I'm just telling you that we live in a world where every year hundreds of thousands of new chemicals are produced, and it gets on the food. It's in the water. It can be on the grass that you walk on. Um, uh, and not to mention the things that we get exposed to just from drinking our, you know, drinking our water and other, you know, infectious agents and things like that. So... My goal is to remove pathogens that interfere with organ, gland, or system function. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about causes here. And I just mentioned a few of them, but I kind of look at it, the causes in two categories. And when I say causes, I'm talking about things that cause sickness and illness and disease. And one of the biggest categories has to do with the things that we might consider living, like bacteria, viruses, fungals, molds, and parasites. And uh, I, my son, one of my sons, is actually in Brazil right now on a mission trip. And he reached out um, on GroupMe a couple days ago and said something about, Dad, they just pulled a worm out of my toe. I'm like, oh, what do you mean by worm? Well, it's a parasite. And I don't know if he's walking around barefoot and through, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. But he's got a worm in his foot. And by the way, I sent him down there with stuff to try to help this. But, you know, it's a pathogen. It gets in the body. He, the, a couple days later, he texts me and says, Dad, I've got rash on both arms and both legs. And so, I mean, he's in an environment he's not used to, right? He's in, the, he's in the jungle down there. And so I don't know what kind of stuff he's getting exposed to. But these pathogens. The second thing or the second category is, is other like chemical toxins. I would also include radiation in here. Back in 2011, um, the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant was overran by a tsunami in Japan. I don't know if you remember that at all. Well, that radio radioactive material got into the ocean and it, came, it comes across and hits the west coast of the US. It's also in the atmosphere. So um, there was a time when with the testing I do, I was finding a lot of Fukushima radiation in people because it was getting into the crops. So these things, you, you don't know where they come from necessarily, but it's, it's a combination of different types of chemicals. Like for me, it was Roundup, um, uh, mercury in fish and in dental fillings is very common. Um, we, we talk about herbicides and pesticides, a ton of that. Um, atrazine is the most common. And I'll tell you, the most common chemical that I'm finding right now in people is Ohio train chemicals. Do you guys remember the derailment that occurred? It was February 2nd, uh, 23. And a train in East Palestine, Ohio derailed, and it was carrying something called vinyl chloride. And so vinyl chloride got dumped into the Ohio River and all these little tributaries. And that, that area over there actually has a lot of farming. Not to mention, then they're like, well, what are we going to do with this? They decided to burn it. When you burn vinyl chloride, it turns into dioxin. 
Dioxin is a banned substance, got into the atmosphere, and now it rains down on the crops. So we're f I have a colleague in Florida who was the first one who, who told me about it, and he said, yeah, I've got people who are coming from this, um, east, eastern Ohio and Pennsylvania who we're finding these chemicals in. And he said, I'm finding it as far as Indiana. Fast forward now, it's come as far as Minnesota. Now, I don't have a study to show you guys. I don't have a research article to say, oh, this is in the, I'm just telling you what, with, with bioresonance testing is what we're finding in people. So we get all these different types of toxins. Now, I wanna talk for a couple minutes about um, you know, causes versus symptoms. So <clears throat> a symptom is something that you feel, right? It's, it's, it's where you've got um, acid reflux or you've got you know, indigestion, you've got a cough. The things that you feel, those are your symptoms. And symptoms can be local, like my shoulder hurts. Um, you can kind of point to it. Or they can be more systemic. And that's something like chronic fatigue. I'm, I'm tired all the time, doc. You know, I'm, um, my muscles all hurt. I've been told I have fibromyalgia. My muscles hurt. My joints all hurt. So that's more systemic. Now, in, as you know, in traditional uh, healthcare, when you have a symptom, uh, you, you want to do something about it. So you go into the doctor and... They, they pair that symptom up and they kind of name it. And then they basically tell you that's the cause. You've got Hashimoto's disease. And it's almost presented like that's the cause. Or you have acid reflux, that's the cause. And then what happens? You get a medicine, okay? Now there's a time and a place for a medicine, right? My son who's down there with s some weird infection I'm actually okay with him getting an, an, an antibiotic because I can't, I can't do something with him right now. There's a time and a place for it. But it really doesn't do us a lot of good if we just name something, but we don't actually find why. So what we try to do is to actually locate the tissue first. Which tissue in that body or tissues is in a state of distress? It's out of tune, slightly. And this is where it gets kind of weird because you could, you could say, well, doc, my, I've got, it's, it's got to be my stomach. I've got acid reflux. I've got burning in my chest. The doctors told me it's that. Okay. What if you have an H. pylori bacterial infection in your large intestine, which is downstream, but because of the relationship of how everything works together and everything affects everything else, what if that H. pylori bacteria was actually causing a decrease in your ability to make hydrochloric acid in your stomach. The, the mainstream way they're going to do that is give you a meprazole. It decreases stomach acid. But we want to look at the whole body and say, gosh, you could, you could have an infection. You could have something in your big toe that could be affecting your heart. So we want to look at the whole body, all the different tissues, organs, glands, and systems. I care about symptoms, absolutely, because symptoms kind of help point me to tissues. I got to be honest with you, I don't care a lot about name diseases. I don't think that does a lot for us. We got to find, find where, and then, most importantly, why, as we talked about earlier. What? What is the thing? And as I said earlier, remember, every atom has a frequency, and you bring enough of those together, and you get a substance. Therefore, every kind of pathogen that you can name has its own frequency as well. It's very unique to it. For example, in my little, my little kit here, where's my next? Um, here's antibiotics. So what they've done is, in this case, was they measured the frequency of lots of the most common antibiotics and then put them all into this one, this one test file. So it's not, very, it's not as specific as I'd like to get, but I could start here and say, oh yeah, you've got antibiotic residues in your small intestine, probably because when you were a kid, you had chronic strep throat, and they kept giving you antibiotics over and over and over. So the causes interfere with body tissues, which results in symptoms known as a named disease. So this is something else I want to highlight for a moment, that one set of symptoms can have multiple causes over time. And here are, here are some examples. 
So a patient presents, somebody comes in. This has been really common this year, by the way, a sore throat and a cough. Anybody know people with that lately? Oh my goodness, this year was crazy, right? Lots of sore throats, lots of coughing. Um, and they come in and we, we test them out, and sure enough, there's a, there's a bacteria there. Could be, could be strep, could be staph, could be lots of things. We make a remedy, a protocol for them. They leave, they go home, they're doing better. They're doing great. They didn't, they didn't go and get antibiotics, they didn't do that, way. they got better. A few weeks go by and they come back, doc, my sore throat and my cough is back. I check them, it's not a bacteria. It's not a bacteria, this time it's a chemical. It's Ohio train chemicals, or it's aspartame, second most common chemical I find, by the way. And just as a little side note for you guys, in 2013, the FDA stopped requiring aspartame to be put on labels. And so people are buying stuff that care, are looking, but it's not listed. It's a really cheap sweetener. And so they put it in all kinds of stuff. It's even in detergents. It's in things you would never expect. Like, why would, they, why would that be in there? It's in some of the municipal water supplies. It's just in weird places. But anyway, we test them. You know what? It's not, it wasn't a bacteria. It's a chemical. We make a protocol. We get the chemical out. A couple weeks go by. A month goes by. Here they are again. And, you know, they're getting a little bit chapped. Like, why am I not better? Well, I I'm sorry. Your tissue was weakened because of other things that happened in your life. This time, a virus lodged there. So the point I'm getting at is that the tissues... Um, the tissues of the body get, get weakened because of certain pathogens that may have been left there for a period of time. And now you get exposed to something and that thing goes to the place that was weak. I have an example of myself with a rotator cuff. So I played baseball growing up, I've got a bad rotator cuff and I, almost, I can always tell when I'm starting to get sick because I feel it in my rotator cuff first. That's where it goes. And so if I can get ahead of it, awesome. But um, so th the whole point is that is of that is that we can't just rely on on a, 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 a symptom to to be our health care. We care. We we need to look for specific tissues, specific organs, and then even more importantly, what is it? What is it? So let's talk a little bit about this 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 whole concept of bioresonance testing. By the way, um, I, I kind of think about bioresonance, that term, or bioresonance testing as an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella are lots of different techniques or systems of analysis. There are some, and I was actually talking to somebody a little bit ago who was asking me about um, computer-based bioresonance testing. And there are machines out there where people have actually programmed the frequencies that we've been talking about into a machine and then the machine will actually um, interact with your body and give you a list of things that might be out of tune. So there's that. Those are computer-based. I'm the computer in, in, our, in, our, in our way of thinking. And um, I use a system using an autonomic neurologic reflex. So what does that mean? Well, let me give you an analogy real quick. Pupils, okay? Your pupils, when you walk into a dark room, what happens? They open up. Why? 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 No, just kidding. Um, right. So the stressor is I can't see, right? And I'm going to trip or I'm going to hit something. So God designed us with this reflex. Pupils get big. Now, you walk out of that dark room into a sun filled day, what happens? Constriction, right? They go down instantly. Again, built in. Not one time in your life did you ever think about it, nor could you make it happen if you wanted to. It does this 24-7 for your whole life, up and down. It's an autonomic reflex, okay? It's not the same kind of reflex as the patellar tendon reflex, okay? It's different. We use an autonomic reflex that we call muscle testing. It's a result of a muscle response. And there's lots of ways to do it. Some of you may have seen somebody who does a straight arm muscle test. I use something called an O-ring. Why an O-ring? I've just found that patients feel it a little bit easier than a straight arm because this is a long lever 
and I don't have to, I, it doesn't take me much to kind of push down. But when I'm just doing this, and my hand interlocks around their fingers, and I pull, I'm looking for either a strong, where it stays together strong, or it slightly comes apart. And it's almost like something you, you, you have to experience it to really get a picture for it. Um, but does anybody want to try? She does. You want to come up for a second? Okay. Ooh, I hope this works. <laughs> What's your name? Alan. Hi, Alan. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. You have, uh, is that a, like Fitbit. a Bluetooth Fitbit? Yeah. Yep. We'll take that off. Mm -hmm. And watch e too. EMF devices can mess with, uh, with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are you right-handed or left? Right. Okay, cool. So here's how we would do this. We would just have your arm just comfortable right there, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have you take a, you know, use your a ring finger ring and finger. your thumb. Yep. Okay. And so the idea is that I'm going to come in like this, mm -hmm. and I'm just basically going to be pulling apart slightly. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and match me. I just want you to just mm -hmm. get, get a solid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not pulling very hard. Mm -hmm. You can tell that just mm -hmm. barely. Now, um, do you have any health issues? Um, left knee. Sorry, you sh I should ask, do you mind sharing no, this no. with people? <laughs> your left knee. Uh, I've had a knee replacement. You have? Yeah. Okay. Um, Do you want to so non? No, no, that's, that, okay. that's fine. So th there's um, the way that I would do this then is we take a test file. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to grab. Let's go with. Well, let's go with nerve, nerve system. So I'm going to have her hold this little test file in this hand. Mm -hmm. You give me those fingers like this. Yeah, just squeeze it. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be that she would put this on the area that we're trying to test. Okay. Okay. Now, if it locks in strong, which she does, okay, that's an indication that there's something wrong there. If she had broke apart real easily, and by the way, this is the opposite of what some people would ha that have had resonance testing would say. But here's the idea. Um, if, if, if we're testing a pathogen, mm -hmm. okay, and let's say that the pathogen was MRSA, okay, okay that's, a, that's a staph infection that comes after surgery. That's why I brought that. It, it, it happens all the time. And uh, these MRSA infections are under the radar a lot of times. In other words, you don't have redness, you don't have swelling, you don't have fever, you don't have all the kind of traditional bacterial infection signs. But the knee doesn't seem to heal. Mm -hmm. And people will say, Doc, I got this surgery and it just doesn't seem to heal. So I've got a MRSA here, like we're gonna just say it's a MRSA. And if we put the MRSA on there, mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna say that she's got MRSA in her knee. So if she has a quantity of a substance like MRSA, let's just say it's 100, it's a count of 100. And I bring additional quantity of that same substance, that same frequency, to the same tissue. And let's say that this was 100. Mm -hmm. Now I have what? 200. 200. That, that combination or that additive effect creates a biggerness. Okay, it's a, it, it makes something bigger, and the autonomic reflex locks in strong. If the substance that I'm testing is not there, like um, coronavirus is not there, then the muscle goes weak because I didn't add something to something that wasn't there. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a quick way that we can get to very specific frequency that is out of, you know, that, that is lodged in that, in that tissue. Mm -hmm. Okay? Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we use the muscle testing and we use the vials to direct us to the right... Um, pathogen in the various tissues of the body. And you can do it on any point. You can do it on a point of pain, or you can do it on points that I call circuit points. Some people call them acupuncture points. That's what they are. They're acupuncture points. I think there's an acupuncturist here to teaching today. And the point is that I call them circuits because I think of them as a circuit. On the surface of the body, there are points that actually run through, a, through an electrical um, pathway to the various organs. My stomach point is right here. I can test the stomach right there. 
And so I can take a very specific frequency, put it on that point, test the circuit. If the circuit, the circuit will be either, either show up as strong or weak. And that's going to gauge us to what we need to do. That's what we call muscle testing because we're using the muscle, but in reality, it's the autonomic nerve response. So again, we're going to try to identify the pathogen, the tissue that it's at, and then we got to figure out what we're going to do with it. We're going to create protocols to try to remove that pathogen. Now, the protocols we use is based in the field of homeopathy. There's somebody here who's a homeo uh, uh, I think a classical homeopath. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm not a classical homeopath. I know a little bit about it. I use something called causative homeopathy. And again, we're going to be looking at the very specific organ tissues, but also the very specific pathogens. And so if you had a MRSA infection in your knee, one of the things we might do is to make a remedy that is the frequency of MRSA, MRSA bacteria. So we treat what you have with what you have. That's the idea of homeopathy, like treats like, as opposed to med medication that is the exact opposite. If you have a bacterial infection, they give you an antibiotic. It's the opposite. So it's called the law of similars. You probably learn a lot more about that from the homeopath. But the point is, is that the idea is that when you, when you put that frequency, let's say of MRSA, into the body via a drop under the tongue, it's like giving the entire body a wake up to look for that frequency. My, my quick analogy is this. You're sleeping at night. You, you and your spouse are in bed together. You hear a loud noise. Wakes you up. It's kind of scary. The wife nudges the husband. The husband gets up to go look for it. Now, as he's walking through the house, he's wondering, hey, is there a, somebody, did somebody break into the house? And so for those few minutes, he's on high alert. But then he looks outside and he realizes, oh, the wind was blowing and it blew over the trash can and that's what woke me up. So threat, you know, done, nothing there anymore. But for those moments, he was on high alert. So that drop of that very specific frequency is like giving your uh, immune system, your nervous system, all the systems, a little bit of a wake up. Go on high alert, go look for that very specific pathogen and mount an appropriate response against it. So in reality, I've never healed anybody of anything ever, not once, okay? God put healing inside of you. It's already there, I can't add to it, but if it's interfered with, then we wanna find that and then we remove it. That's the whole point. So that's where the remedies come in. They go very specific. They remove the, uh, they tell your, your body to remove the pathogen. And then guess what? When you remove the pathogen, now that tissue doesn't have that interference anymore. It can start to produce the chemicals it needs to. The immune system can get at it better. And now it can actually heal. That's the beauty. So that's bioresonance testing. And I, I appreciate you guys coming. I think my time is about done. I have a few minutes left. Okay, I've got a few minutes left. So um, I wanted to do one more thing since we got a minute here. It might take a few people. Does anybody mind holding hands? You guys mind holding hands? I just want to show you something. Um, you guys want to help me? Okay, do you want to come too? You said you would. So to talk about how our body is electrical, I have this really cool toy here. So would you guys, you mind holding her hands? Okay, you wanna hold hands? Yeah, we could have the whole room hold hands and then we could, <laughs> okay. So I'll hold your hand here. Now, what's gonna happen, some of you can't see this, but um, I'm holding this little thing and there's a little silver tab on one end. Now you hold the silver tab on the other end. Well, it scared you a little bit, didn't it? Okay, and we let go. So all this does is to show that we are electrical beings, right? I mean, we all knew that, but I think this is really cool, right? If I had a thousand people all holding hands and we all did this, it would be instantaneous. Why? Because electricity flows through people. It's a great example of how resonant works, okay? Resonant frequencies and how it flows through people. So um, thank you guys, thanks for helping. And uh, if you guys have questions about this, a lot of people, it's hard to talk about it all like right now, but we'll, we'll have a table over there. Please come and and ask me specifics if you want. I don't mind talking about specific health problems. Uh-oh, the homeopath raises her hand. Uh oh, 
Okay. Yeah. 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 No. So you're so again you're talking in um in, in classical, right? And and forgive me if I if I mis misspeak about this. My understanding of of classical is it, most of the frequencies you're using are based off of plants, correct? No. Okay. Okay. So, right, so you would start with the physical thing. You'd actually have, let's say, a plant, and then you would take that and you would dilute it, and then you'd take that dilution and you'd dilute it, and you'd keep diluting each dilution until all you had left was the frequency of the original substance. Okay, so um, the, if I'm answering your question correctly, the, the frequencies I'm giving are either going to be the frequency of an actual uh, infectious agent or chemical, or, or uh, a body tissue. So you said mercurius, right? No, I, I don't use those kind at all. Yeah, so that, that would be the difference. Yes, yeah, and I'd love to talk to you more if you want on the, on the thing, but yes, sir. Right. Yeah. There's there's actually mounting research uh, about the effects, and I, I, if you're talking about, um, I, I'll I'll answer with EMFs, for example. Is that kind of what you're you're asking? Anything? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We there there's a a growing body of research that is showing that the thing we carry in our pocket all day long um, gives off electromagnetic frequencies that can be harmful and actually damage our DNA. Um, this, we've got Bluetooth, we've got um, 5G, um, there's actually other levels of, of G I've heard about that's just not known to the public, 6, 7, um, there's, uh, there, are, there are ways that the stuff is being sent out, you know, that we can't see and it is, it is damaging the DNA to some degree. Um, there are devices there are some devices out there that can be protective against those things in our body. Uh, I don't think we can escape them all, at, at, you know. And so, that, I think that's a big piece of the puzzle we don't know yet. Like, we're, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna get away from that? But there are technologies that you can even plug into your home uh, that run through your circuitry that harmonize. They're called harmonizers. So they take what would be a, a frequency that could be harmful to you and turn it into something that is, I guess, neutral. So I, I hope I answered that question. We could talk more too at the, the table. Um, uh, is that it? Yeah, go ahead. That's my understanding, yes, that if, if the lung is working the way it's supposed to, it should have an ideal frequency. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? I'll end really quick with one more story. One more story. Okay, this is probably my, um, my favorite story. A patient comes to me. Um, he showed up in my office. It was early November of this particular year. And what had happened was in September of that year, he had been out on his combine. He's a farmer from near here at Faribault. And he was driving along and he felt a click in his brain. And he didn't know who he was or where he was. He was conscious, but he basically sat and waited till his family came looking for him that night. So he ends up going to Mayo and 
um, these are his words. He sa said that they, they sent me to a, a dozen neurologists and endocrinologists, and after several weeks of all this kind of testing, they told him, well, you have, you have hypothyroidism. <laughs> um, here's, some, here's some thyroxin hormone. And they said, there's something wrong with your brain that we, you need to go home and get your, your, your affairs in order. You're, you're going to be dead by June. And they didn't even really give him a reason why. Now, when I first saw him, he's sitting in my, uh, in my uh, reception area, and he's, he's kind of ornery, right? He's a little grumpy, he's, and he's a farmer. He's already a little bit rough around the edges. <laughs> and he was wearing his, uh, his glasses, and he had, his, he had painted one lens with silver. I'm like, I didn't quite get that, but I found out that the reason was because he had developed double vision in that eye, and it was vertical, one on image on top of the other. It's very hard to do anything when you've got two images. And so if he just blocked it, then he didn't see two images. So he comes in, and we did some testing. And what we found was that he had a parasite in his brain. And we were able to kind of trace it back to he and his wife had gone on a cruise, and they had gone to some um, offshore excursion, and some guy had a monkey, and the monkey jumped on his head. And that, that's what we think. He had, he had, like, dug into his head a little bit. Again, we don't know for sure, but he thinks that may be the, been the cause. But anyway, um, we found parasites in his brain, and we gave him drops. What, what kind of drops? These remedies. The remedy was for a very specific um, parasite known as Ascaris. Ascaris typically is found in, in, the, in the GI system. It's a roundworm. But it was showing up in his brain. And so sent him home with some remedies. He comes home, or he comes back to the office about a month later, and he says, he was, his double vision was gone. It was, I mean, it was, it was cleared. And I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, I, I had a bloody nose. And when I pulled the tissue away from my nose, it was full of worms. <laughs> and I was kind of blown away because I don't even think, there, I don't even know how the worms got out that way through there. I mean, you got the bone and everything through there. But... So that was just, a, just another, just an example of when you give the body what it needs, example, in this case, very specific frequency for a parasite, it told the body to get rid of those parasites, and they came out, and now he's doing a lot better. So. Anyway, thank you. I'll be glad to talk to you guys more out at the booth.